Fing mosquito in my eye. <clears throat> here are the bloopers. There are a ton of mosquitoes here. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm doing this for the art, damn it! The Blair Witch Project was not the first found footage horror film, though it was one of the first to take advantage of the growing popularity of the internet. Back in 1999, fans of the film could visit a website called BlairWitch.com to read up on the lore behind the titular witch, as well as the fates of the three amateur documentarians who totally went missing and died while conducting research in the woods. This site, as well as the whole premise that the tapes had been found out in the real American wilderness, made for a film with a unique sense of authenticity. That's a mosquito right there. No, I think this is it. <laughs> the loudest cyclist I've ever heard. At the time of this recording, 24 years have passed. The internet has grown beyond being used as a successful marketing tool for one horror film into becoming a part of its own subgenre. In a time where authenticity is being questioned more than ever, I thought it would be interesting to explore just how much of the original found footage genre has changed and adapted to the internet, and how much has remained the same. And that's it! <laughs> we did it! The question that perplexes me the most when approaching this topic is... What do we even call this subgenre? Despite having existed for quite some time now, we have yet to agree on a universally recognized label for it. Internet horror? Well, it certainly fits under that umbrella, but it's way too broad. Social media horror? More specific, but it also includes films which merely contain social media not exclusively films which use it as their framing device. This is why I've personally settled on using the somewhat established term screen life horror. I chose this one because throughout significant parts of these films, the screen through which the audience is watching events unfold is diegetic. The illusion that this subgenre wants to create is that you are experiencing this footage in real time, just like a viewer within the film's internal fiction would. These films present this reality in one of two ways. You have the films which depict a live stream or a video where the characters address the fictitious audience directly, and where written comments from said audience become a reoccurring element on screen. In this category, we find films like Deadstream, Dashcam, and Spree. Then there are the films where the audience, the real one, becomes an unaddressed intruder. Films which generally take place inside private conversations through more closed forms of social media like Discord, Skype, or Zoom. Here we find films such as Unfriended, Host, and We're All Going to the World's Fair. You could also be really reductive about it and say that one style mainly uses GoPros, while the other uses webcams. A good place to start is the 2015 film Unfriended. Again, not the first of its kind, but it arguably popularized the look that screen life horror has today. Or I don't know, maybe more people saw the den and open windows than I thought. Apart from the very last moment of the film, the audience is never allowed to see the world beyond what's presented on this singular desktop. It's not a static or boring experience, though. You get the character interactions through the Skype video chat, you get the soundtrack from the protagonist's own music library, and you get your visual variety through the switching to various windows and tabs. What made Unfriended stand out as a horror experience in particular is how it used this desktop to create a level of intimacy no found footage horror film previously could. A film like The Blair Witch Project contains a whole lot of emotional honesty, due to how it closely captures the gradual degradation of the characters' relationships and mental states. Here, though, you don't just see Blair through her webcam. Wait, is that a deliberate reference? You see her Facebook wall, what music she listens to on Spotify, what she Googles. Watching Unfriended gave me a similar feeling to the one I had while playing through the semi-autobiographical Nina Freeman game, Sybil, where you're free to browse through everything from her private messages to self-written poetry and revealing images of Nina Freeman herself. Sybil wasn't meant to be a horror game by any means, at least I don't think so. 
But having access to all of this deeply personal information is horrifying, in a way. This desktop, and what it contains, is not meant for you. It shouldn't be, anyway. Yet, here you are, like a tech-savvy internet stalker, digging through the files of someone with no knowledge of your presence. It's something we have all come to accept, but that also scares us once we start to really think about it. That someone, or something, is looking at everything that we do while we're sitting at our computers. It's the reason why people put pieces of tape over their built-in laptop cameras. When we watch a screen life horror film, we embody that exact thing we fear so much. And the discomfort that evokes is almost enough to make Unfriended, and the subgenre as a whole, particularly unnerving. What severely undermines the effectiveness of this film is how cynical it is about its teenage cast. Films about obnoxious adolescents being murdered is as common as clowns within the horror genre. Although, this might be the first time that I've watched a film that audibly made me go, you know what? I think this film genuinely hates teenagers. Teens can be terrible, anyone who has ever been one knows this all too well. However, there isn't even one character in Unfriended who manages to avoid the label of irredeemable asshole. The plot revolves around a humiliating video of a young girl named Laura Barnes, where she's laying blackout drunk on the ground with her underwear soiled and exposed. Laura then decides to take her own life as the video leaks online. On the one year anniversary of her death, a bunch of kids who used to know her have a chat over Skype, when an anonymous account claiming to be Laura starts to supernaturally pick them off one by one. Each and every participant in the call are blamed for their schoolmate's suicide, one way or another, and the film couldn't make it any more clear that it wants you to blame them as well. It's not an uncommon tactic when writing screenplays for horror films, to have characters be awful in such a way that the audience doesn't have to think twice about enjoying their brutal demise. The issue here is that there's just a complete lack of nuance. Every character has been as disgusting and cruel towards Lara as they've been towards everyone else. They lie, they cheat, they humiliate, and once their deeds are finally revealed, the apologies ring hollow. The film's only solution is to scorch the earth and rid the world of these unequivocal villains. It's a power fantasy for those with a seething hate for post-internet youth culture. Those who'd rather sit and criticize all that the kids are doing on the internet without seeing any of the benefits, or how one could actually approach solving the problems. Unfriended is a film that simply wants you to watch these kids die. Also, a little fun fact, Jacob from College Humor is in this film. Like, in a prominent role. And I have to say that I'm very happy that he's doing much better work nowadays. <laughs> there is an appealing aspect to Unfriended that sadly gets lost in all of this cynicism. Something that 2020 film host, fortunately, picked up on. While Unfriended distracts with its focus on how vile and cruel its characters are, Host has its eyes firmly set on exploring what makes social media an effective and above all, ironic setting for horror fiction in general. To say that Host is a product of its time could not be more accurate. There is a chance that the film wouldn't have existed if it weren't for Unfriended. Although, Due to some very specific events in the year 2020, it wouldn't be surprising if the obvious similarities were actually just coincidences. It was written and produced during the COVID-19 pandemic, and as we all know, that led to a long period of people staying mostly locked up indoors, which then led to people using the social media platform Zoom to study and work from home, and there you go. 
you got yourself the premise for a horror film right there. That's not me making a clever observation, by the way. It's as explicit as it can get. The characters make overt references to the lockdown and specifically use Zoom as their means of communication. Hell, the film even adapts the platform's 40-minute time limit into its runtime, something that's integrated so well that it could almost be called a plot twist. It forces a very abrupt end to the film. But not even when it's over does it abandon its framing device. As the list of participants in the call starts scrolling down, you'll realize that it's actually the end credits. This film is so fucking good, oh my god. The plot is so simple that one wouldn't be wrong for calling it generic. To entertain themselves during quarantine, a group of adult friends hire a medium to perform a seance over Zoom, and I don't think I need to tell you a single thing that happens after that. It's the framing device that truly elevates the material. The strengths of Unfriended are all here, but because this film came out during COVID, Host highlights the desperation and isolation many of us likely felt when we weren't able to be physically close to the people we care about. In this Zoom call, these characters are able to interact with one another as if they're all in the same room. Yet they are so far apart that they're ultimately helpless to save each other or themselves once faced with danger. This is the perfect irony of screen life horror. In any other type of horror film, there's at least the possibility that the characters will be able to step in and protect their peers from getting axed. Screen life horror is about removing that possibility. About rendering the characters as powerless as the audience. Because they are a part of the audience. Zoom's various features are also eloquently woven into the film's scares. There's one scene where the character Caroline shows off a custom background that plays a short clip of her entering her bedroom and brushing her hair on repeat. A typical example of the kind of fun people try to make out of having to sit through Zoom calls hours on end every day. The background returns later, but this time it flickers between the pre-recorded loop and images of Caroline being beaten bloody by the nefarious entity they mistakenly summoned. As she dies, the feed goes back to playing the loop, eerily contrasting the casual demeanor of past Caroline with the present one lying dead, out of frame. It's geniusly inventive, and it's a scare that only really makes sense within the context of social media. Same can be said of the excellent setup and payoff where Emma, who has been playing around with face filters during the call, suddenly stands in front of a floating, bodiless mask, implying that whatever it is that's out to get her is real enough to be recognized as a person by her laptop's camera. The greatest strength of Host, however, is one it heavily shares with the Blair Witch Project. That sense of authenticity. Not only does the familiar format of Zoom and the unpolished images captured by the low-fidelity webcams make the film's fantastical elements feel slightly more believable, the actors use their real names. The locations are the actors' real-life homes. They all knew each other fairly well before they began shooting, and all of the dialogue is improvised. Just like the production of The Blair Witch Project, the actors were only given treatments of the script to steer them and the plot in the right direction. What happened and what was said in between the significant plot beats was entirely up to them. Making a film this way requires a whole lot of functional chemistry among the cast. And the cast of hosts absolutely nailed it. Not a second goes by where you feel like these aren't believable people. Even the more awkward and stiff moments work because, hey, that's par for the course when you're talking over Zoom. Host is the prime example of what a screen life horror film is. What it should be. It takes what worked for the found footage genre and elegantly adapts it to a medium that makes it feel even more relatable. Even more real. However, it is, as previously stated, a product of its time. And that could just as well be used as negative criticism. The World Health Organization declared COVID-19 to no longer be a global health emergency this year. 
2023. Will this aspect of hosts really hit the same for someone who didn't live through it personally? Time will tell, I guess. But what about Zoom? I haven't used it since I graduated from uni. Have any of you used it recently? It's a cliche, I know, but technology really does move so fast. What was new yesterday will be old news tomorrow. Skype, which was the social media platform used for Unfriended, has also lost a lot of its relevance. And who knows in what state Twitter or X will be in by the time you're watching this video. Host will be a very interesting relic to look back on. But it is already a relic. Maybe the more timeless screen life horror films will be those that focus more on the human element than the novelty of certain social media platforms. Which leads us to we're all going to the world's fair. The only film on this list which technically doesn't fit the mold of screen life horror due to how it repeatedly breaks its number one rule. It shows the world beyond the screen. Although, in my opinion, it still counts. The reason World's Fair can't commit fully to its framing device is because it's also about creating screen life horror and the potential consequences of creating it as a young, inexperienced artist. It breaks form in order to make the audience question the authenticity of what's presented. Are things truly as they seem? How much do you know about the main character, really? Are they obligated to let you know anything at all? The titular World's Fair is an internet-based game, or challenge, in which the participants recite the words I want to go to the World's Fair Bloody Mary style, after which they watch a video that consists of nothing but flashing lights. They're then supposed to document the symptoms brought on by this ritual. Everyone seems to react differently. In one video, a participant describes it as if there is a game of Tetris being played inside of his torso. In another, there's a woman who claims to have been turned into plastic. Terrifying stuff if it was real. In actuality, the World's Fair challenge is creepypasta, a fictional concept people on the internet use as a creative outlet to tell scary stories that build upon the work of others. One such creative is Casey, a teenager living in middle of Nowheresville, surrounded by empty fields and busy highways. From what's shown of Casey's life away from her desktop, she mostly wanders around alone. When she isn't making her own videos, she mainly watches other World's Fair related content. And whenever her dad gets home, she quickly retreats to her upstairs bedroom, almost as if she's afraid of him. Casey is no influencer. She doesn't have a massive audience of loyal like button smashers. She creates her videos simply because she enjoys the game. Or maybe because she genuinely doesn't have anyone else she wants to, or can, spend her time with. Enter JLB, a fellow World's Fair enthusiast who reaches out to Casey by taking footage from one of her videos and creepily distorts her face. The video ends with the words, You're in trouble. Which is an ironically appropriate red flag given the circumstances. You see, JLB is an older man way older than Casey, living in a big and luxurious house. There is no good reason for a stranger in this position to be reaching out to talk to a teenager. Yet, that's exactly what he does. He has Skype calls with Casey, and when she doesn't respond, he pushes her to keep making videos so that he knows that she is okay. There's nothing sexual about their relationship but there is no doubt an aspect to it that has the word groomer written all over it. Casey's videos gradually get more and more intense. It reaches a point where she brings up a plan for killing her dad with his own rifle, which worries JLB so much that he reaches out to tell her that he considered calling the police. This enrages Casey. She scolds him for thinking, even for a second, that she would treat the World's Fair challenge as anything but a game of fantasy. She ends the call with the reveal that Casey isn't even her real name. And that's the last we ever hear or see from her. Since we're shown those glimpses of Casey's life outside of the challenge, we're essentially tricked into seeing things from JLB's perspective. We see Casey being lonely, we see that she has a rough relationship with her father, and we see that the gun that she says she will use to kill him 
is in fact real. She fits so neatly into the stereotype of an American teenage school shooter. So it's no wonder that anyone would take her seriously when she starts talking about causing someone real life harm. But think about all of the things that we don't see her school life, if she has any friends who she talks to besides JLB, the reason she avoids her dad. As pointed out by a great letterbox review written by Cam Marshall, we don't even know what Casey's gender is. For all we know, Casey's simply an angsty and socially awkward teen exploring dark subject matter through online art. Is it valid to be worried for Casey? Sure, but with so little information on who this person actually is, a person who isn't even named Casey, it's neither our or JLB's place to demand to know more about them. So Casey doesn't just cut ties with JLB, she cuts ties with the audience. All we're left with is JLB retelling a story of how he and Casey met in New York and made up. However, this story is very likely just as fictional as the one Casey told through her videos. One of the standout lines from the film is Casey saying, I swear, someday soon, I am just gonna disappear. And you won't have any idea what happened to me. It's ominous. But when contextualized with the film's ending, it's actually a fairly uplifting message. Casey, the persona, does indeed disappear, but the person behind it doesn't. The quote then ends up being a statement about setting boundaries, of not being obligated to tell an audience of fans where you go or how long you will be away. Whoever Casey actually is, their life will likely continue. And we, like JLB, are just gonna have to live with not knowing what that life looks like. In a way, we're all going to the World's Fair feels like a direct response to Unfriended, like a bookend to a short-lived era of screen life horror films. Teens are not the worst people on the planet. It is we who have gotten out of touch. There are no demons roaming the internet. Only people. And some of those people should just mind their own business. What about the GoPro style of screen life horror films then? And the films about people who do strive towards becoming successful influencers? What are their connection to the original found footage genre? From an aesthetic point of view, it's obvious. You've got people running around out and indoor environments with their personal cameras attempting to capture some spooky shit. Where they deviate thematically is that screen life horror tends to tell tales about the corrupting influence the internet can have on the people who aim to capture this footage. Because of the abundance of similarities between this type of screen life horror films, I'm mainly going to focus on one, the 2020 film, Spree. Put bluntly, Spree is fucking terrifying. Its premise is a bit too bonkers to be taken completely seriously, but the subtext is chilling for anyone who's ever tried making a living off of online content creation. Someone like me. Spree follows Kurt Kunkel, a young man obsessed with gaining clout on social media. He adapts to all of the new trends, and he unashamedly attempts to leech off of the success of a huge influencer he used to babysit as a kid. The main problem is that Kurt is kind of terrible. He has no on-camera charisma, no sense of self-awareness, and no shampoo to get rid of the grease in his hair. In a last-ditch effort to become a celebrity, he uses his job as a spree driver to find and murder people live on stream. There's no hesitation, no remorse, his first victim is his own mother for God's sake. And it's all in service of gaining higher numbers of views and subscribers. He's basically the person JLB thought Casey was slowly becoming in We're All Going to the World's Fair. A person so corrupted by their creative work online that they'd sacrifice their own humanity as well as the lives of others. Don't think about the numbers, they say. They mostly meaning other content creators. Hell, that's what I used to say. But when you believe you've found your calling, when you've discovered the outlet that grants you the highest amount of creative fulfillment in life, it's 
beyond disheartening when platforms you're basically forced to use to even have an inkling of a chance to be noticed, like YouTube or Twitter, repeatedly undermine your sense of accomplishment by burying your hard work within unpredictable algorithms, which never seem to favor what you do, no matter how much you try. No matter how much it feels like you're making things that are qualitatively adjacent to the work of your successful peers. One of the genuine horrors I experience daily while browsing YouTube is when I'm randomly recommended stuff like Insert Name of Game Let's Play Part 24 with little to no views. Maybe the people behind those videos don't care as much about making it as I do. Maybe they're perfectly satisfied with doing what they do just for fun. All the power to them in that case. I just can't get it out of my head though. The frustration I would feel if I was one of those people and really tried. Currently, I'm very fortunate to have the financial support of around 70 people through the crowdfunding site Patreon. I'm by no means ungrateful for their contributions. I've done YouTube-related work for a literal decade. I've reached a point where I wouldn't be making videos at all if these people didn't believe my work was good enough to pay for. However, I'd argue that I gained those contributions mostly in spite of YouTube. And it's sadly not enough for me to work on this channel full time. Even worse, and more relatable to me personally, is when I stumble upon videos that do have a lot of views, and that are absolutely fantastic. Only when I check out the rest of their channels, there isn't a single video that's reached the same level of recognition. I want to keep exploring these channels both because they managed to hook me with their one popular video, and because I feel like I could maybe help them reach more people by offering them some more views. Although, perhaps hypocritically, I know that I never will. I don't have the time to watch all the things I want. I also don't have the attention span for it. It's in those moments I realize how many people must have stumbled upon one of my videos and reacted the exact same way. Maybe my work is good enough, but no one can change just how many videos there are to watch out there. Some people will win the YouTube lottery and become noticed, people who get to live off of their creative work. Others, many others, will likely never be so lucky. Is there any wonder then why a character like Kurt was created? Why he is so relatable? A platform like YouTube actively preys on the insecurities of those providing it with videos. Even if you don't look for it, even if you're actively trying to avoid it, every creator is blasted with the latest video statistics and analytics every time they open up YouTube studio mode. YouTube tracks how many views your latest video has gotten and compares it to how many views all of your other videos got in the same amount of hours, days, and months post-publication. Best case scenario, it shows you what a huge success your video has been, that all your hard work and avoidance of social events for the sake of editing paid off. Worst case scenario, it hurtfully reminds you every time you sign in, just how much the video failed to live up to everything you've ever done before. And you never know which one it's going to be. That unpredictability can very easily create desperation, which can manifest in subtle ways like abruptly cutting videos with a sponsored ad or a promotion of a Patreon page. Or it can make someone take more drastic measures like deliberately causing controversy or falling into the realm of disingenuous far-right grifters. A slightly more realistic version of Kurt might have done just that. He has tied such a big part of his self-worth to the success of his online persona. He is very much of the opinion that if you don't exist on social media, you don't exist at all. He is the polar opposite to Casey in World's Fair in this regard. To Kurt, Casey's quote about disappearing would read as the death of her relevance as a human being. This is why the producer guy from the film Gonjiam pushes his crew to keep filming, even when they've clearly found themselves in mortal danger. It's why the awful protagonist of Dashcam deliberately attempts to piss almost everyone off. It's why the influencer in Deadstream values salvaging his online brand over his own life. Without the attention, without the never-ending pursuit of channel growth, 
these people don't believe themselves to have anything else. David Holtzman's diary is perhaps the true first found footage film. Its titular character is a man on a mission to record his everyday life in order to make some sense of it. What the meaning is, who he really is. What David doesn't seem to realize, what's pointed out by his artist friend Pepe, is that filmmaking is full of lies. The second the camera starts rolling, whoever stands in front of it will be acutely aware of their stands, how they look, how they sound, what they're saying. They start thinking about where they should put their hands, if they should stand a little bit more to the left or to the right, if what they say will reflect badly on them. David will never be able to find a completely authentic picture of himself this way because he will choose what he wants to show and how much of it. Pepe points out that there is a version of David that he doesn't want to be exposed in the film, but that this David might be the truth. By the end, David has inadvertently revealed this version because, as written by Jamie M. Chrisley for Slant Magazine, he is naked to everyone, but invisible to himself. What starts off as a personal diary ultimately ends up being the story of how David's life and romantic relationship falls apart, and it's almost exclusively due to his own actions. His girlfriend Penny leaves him after he repeatedly disrespects her wishes not to be recorded, and his antisocial behavior only worsens from there. He spies on a female neighbor who lives across the street. He harasses Penny to the point that he receives a restraining order, and close to the end, he has a nine-minute unedited breakdown. To add salt to the wound, someone robs David's apartment while he is away for a funeral, leaving him deprived of the filmmaking equipment he sacrificed everything else in his life for. David Holtzman's diary was released in 1967. It predates YouTube by almost 40 years. Yet, it could just as well have been the real-life story of some moderately popular influencer. The internet changed found footage horror, but it didn't change the people using it. If David Holtzman's diary shows us anything, it's that our narcissistic and voyeuristic tendencies that seek attention have always been there. We just needed cameras to realize it. To quote the series finale of American Vandal, we are not the worst generation we're just the most exposed. It's not that Gen Z suddenly turned into a bunch of David Holtzmans. It's that the internet has officially exposed all of us as the David Holtzmans we really are. This might read as condemnation of all of these traits, but it isn't. Quite the opposite, in fact. There's something genuinely comforting about knowing that these emotions are not only shared, both through time and space, but that they are valid. We all want some form of attention, we all want to be adored, and we're all curious about knowing more about other people than we probably should. These traits can turn us into antisocial monsters, which is why it's of such great importance to set up boundaries for other people and for yourself. To not relay every thought and feeling you have to the world, to dare to take a step back and abandon your dreams of getting noticed, if or when that thought starts rummaging in the back of your head. There is another quote by Chris Lee I like to bring up here. The film's end is an absolute, in a number of ways. At wit's end. Out of options. The end of the real. The end of David's filmmaking aspirations. Nothing has gone well for poor David. But, in the final monologue, there is no tone of despair. 
the director seems to have set him free. When looking at the film this way, David Holtzman's diary ends on a rather positive note. Screen life horror usually doesn't work that way. It's part of the horror genre after all. There isn't much horror to be found in hopeful optimism. What makes some of these stories scary, apart from their aesthetic, is that they're about people who are not set free who break under the weight of their ambitions. I don't want to become a Kurt Kunkel, and I sure as hell don't want to become David Holtzman at his worst. To me, the most inspiring out of all of the characters I've talked about is Casey from We're All Going to the World's Fair, because she reminds me of why I started this whole journey of video making in the first place. Whenever I've been asked about the best part of making my videos, the first thing that has popped into my head every time has been the people I've met because of them. People I consider to be colleagues, friends, sometimes both. Even if there's some amount of despair in being reminded that I am so far away from them, our collaborations and friendly chats have fueled me and my work on this channel for three years now. Even so, that fuel will eventually run out. I don't like to admit it, but it's something I know I must come to terms with. This is, in fact, a job. And unfortunately, it's a job that pays me way less than minimum wage. Enthusiasm will get you far. But if you want to avoid becoming bitter and angry over how things aren't going your way, there is going to be a time when you have to stop. Try something different. Somewhere else. I'll leave you all with these words. Maybe it won't be in one year, five years, or even ten years. But someday, I'm just gonna disappear. And you won't have any idea what happened to me. Thank you for watching.